So as I mentioned, we were interested, could we aggregate these individual level predictions into a model to actually make accurate um, uh, immersion level predictions? And so we call this paper forecasting high tide because we were interested in predicting when are, when are most people online in retweeting so that we could spread our message, right? Um, and this is actually really, you know, kind of pushed by, uh, uh, motivated by a question that Jim Arada, uh, who was an MBA student at the time, asked me, which is, can we predict when a tweet is most likely to get retweeted, right? So one thing to think about is that you want to determine when a large proportion of your followers will be active in the near future. So this is showing four weeks worth of data, and it's showing that the, the peak times that a lot of people are active varies not only based upon the day of the week, but also from week to week. You know, there's some spikes at times and things like that that we need to be able to capture in order to tweet as much as possible, right? Um, now, the optimal time varies from week to day to day and week to week. So the question is, can we do better than a straight up seasonality model? Now, a seasonality model in this case does not mean like spring, fall, whatever. And instead, what we mean is just a time-based pattern that seems to be the same going on and on, right? Um, and um, so we're going to compare our aggregation of individuals model where we take all the causal state models and we aggregate their predictions to a seasonality model and to what's known as an aggregate autoregressive model. An aggregate autoregressive model takes our seasonality model but also adds in a local excitement factor based upon recent activity in the near past. Right? Um, so here's the seasonality model. The seasonality model is really easy. You just look at all the past behavior and you make the you make the prediction that the number of retweets you're going to see at any particular time is an average of all the past times you've seen for that particular day and at that particular time, right? Um, so you just average all the data out, right? So here you have all the data laid on top of each other, and then this blue line is the averages of those data. So that becomes your prediction at any particular time. So if this was the case, and you wanted to say, I want to tweet. At, um, at the optimal time, you tweet like here on the um, uh, Monday to Thursday, right here on the Friday, right, and so forth, Saturdays and Sundays, right? Um, the aggregate autoregressive adds the fact that there's excitement. So actually, this peak in our data, we know it's caused by that. That actually happens to be the capture and death of Osama bin Laden uh, when there's a lot of activity on Twitter around that. Um, and so this is not necessarily something you want to capture because I'm not sure, you know, depending upon what your, your, what message you're interested in broadcasting, you might not want to be highly involved in that conversation, right? Uh, but, you know, maybe what if you're a news organization, for instance, this would be a peak you'd like to be able to predict, right? Um, in which case, um, you, you, you want to be able to capture the local activity that causes that. So the aggregate autoregressive model starts with the seasonality model, but then models a residual component based upon the past history. So if, you know, you can think about it as if it fits a straight line to that past history, and if that straight line looks like it's trending up, it's going to add something to that seasonality model, right? Um, so the aggregation of individuals model is very simple. It's we take those epsilon machines, those um, uh, causal state models that we've created for each of the different users, and we look at what state they're currently in, and what state they're currently in tells us what the probability of them tweeting in the near future is, right? And so then we can aggregate those probabilities, and aggregating across all the probabilities gives us the expected number of tweets to see in the near future, right? So if we have two users that are 50% likely to tweet into the next time period, then when we add them together, we're expecting to see one tweet, right? Because um, that, that's the expected number of tweets that we would see in that space, right? So the question then becomes, using these different methods, how well can we predict that we're within, say, 10% of the uh, top uh, peaking, uh, peak of the period, right? That, that, we will, that the quantile P star will be, um, that will be within that quantile for a particular time period that we're predicting, right? So we, the way you compare these models a lot of times is you don't use a straight up accuracy of prediction instead because you have this this threshold you're varying, which is how likely you are to be at that top. Like you, you need to know what the number is that you're adjusting for. So you use a receiver operator characteristic curve. And what this shows is for each of those threshold values, what is your false positive rate versus your true positive rate, right? And so what 
But the takeaway from this is, is that the aggregation of individuals model does pretty well. And we're comparing two data sets here now. We're looking at 2011 and 2012. And as you can see, the seasonality model um, does pretty well um, in, in 2011. It doesn't do as well in 2012, mainly because a lot of the data is now out of date on that model, right? Whereas the aggregation of individuals model does a much better job of kind of adapting. It also goes down in performance, but you know, not terribly so. And um, the autoregressive model is slightly better in that case, but for a low false positive rate, the aggregation of individuals model does, success, does surprisingly successfully well, right? And in fact, for a low false positive rate is what you wanna see. If you're a marketer who's sending out a lot of content, right? then um, you, you probably only have a limited number of tweets you want to send out per day because otherwise people are going to start thinking you're spamming them. And so you want to have a low false positive rate. You want to be pretty sure that your predictions are right. So even if that means you give up some of your true positive, you'd like to have a low false positive rate of those scenarios, right? Um, and so tweeting in this space is where you want to be. So in general, we would say probably the aggregation of individuals model winds up being the best model in the effective spaces that we're looking at. So what does this all mean in conclusion? Well, what it means is that there's a new way of thinking about building agent-based modeling map models. You can take machine learning, infer rules. I've shown you one way using causal state modeling. You could use decision trees. You could use association rules. You could use a number of different other ways. And, and if you combine them, to create an automatically created agent-based model. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we're the first ones to ever do this, right? We, we, we're, the, we're the first ones to try and start to do this on a regular basis, right? A lot of people have done this kind of in, in one-offs for a particular project. But we're, we're, our goal here is eventually to build a set of knowledge and methods around this uh, to try and really provide some tools for people to do this constantly and eventually build them into something like NetLogo. Right now, a lot of this code is written in Python and other things, right? Um, and, but there's a limitation to this method. It requires high resolution time series data, right? You need to have a lot of data for the causal state model to work, not for the machine learning plus age-based modeling to work, right? But, uh, but for causal state modeling, if that's going to be your solution, you need high resolution data. And in future work, we'd like to build a software platform that will actually do this, um, potentially think about implementing on a GP, GPU architecture, because if you're not, not the execution, because the execution of the model involves a lot of agents interacting, but building the model could be implemented on a GP, GPU, because each of these time series could be read by an individual um, uh, processor who is individually building the causal state modeling or, uh, model for the system, right? And the other thing is, I've only shown you like one step look ahead. Now, the argument that um, Cosma and Jim and several others make is that these models will be predictive as far as possible into the future because we can predict the next step and predict the next step, they're going to do well. But we know it's going to degrade somewhat, right? And so trying to get a better understanding of how quickly that degrades uh, would be interesting to do. Anyways, that's a quick intro into one particular advanced topic that I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, if you have any questions, ping me in the forum, uh, and thanks.